Good morning, or good afternoon, I should say. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you live. I've double booked myself, which is really silly. Um, I'm at a Learning Disability England conference today. So apologies. I thought I'd do a quick recording of the session and then you can watch it live together as a group and hopefully discuss any things that you wanted to discuss. And if you've got any questions, write them down and uh, I'll, I'll come back to you via email. So today we're going to look at IMCA in Serious Medical Treatment Decisions and um, this little session we're going to look at what do we mean by Serious Medical Treatment. Um, it's a funny phrase and there isn't a very clear definition in the Medical Capacity Act or the Code of Practice that says this is what Serious Medical Treatment is. But there is um, guidance about what makes something, what's likely to make something an SMT decision. Then we're going to look at the IMCA role within these SMT decisions and we'll spend a little bit of time thinking about a couple of specific issues that you might come across as an IMCA when, when you're working in this area. So to begin with, go back right to the beginning, um, there are two decisions in the Mental Capacity Act, aren't there, that require an IMCA to be instructed and that's where there's a long-term change of accommodation move and a serious medical treatment decision if the person lacks capacity to make that decision and there's no family friend appropriate to consult with and just again to go back to that basic role you as the advocate are there to support the person through the decision so to help them express their views and wishes and if that's not possible and um, because of the capacity issues or uh, communication and understanding then you're there to represent that individual. So to try and find out their wishes, uh, what they would likely to be, um, and also to check that the process is being completed properly so that the person is being treated fairly and equally. Okay, so let's have a little look at what serious medical treatment is. So it's, as I say, there isn't like a, 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 an easy definition that says this is what it is, but there's these three things that tell us that if the choice of treatment or the investigation you know it covers one of these two things and it's likely to be smt so the first one is if there's a fine balance if there's one single treatment being offered and there's a fine balance between benefits and burdens and you're going to hear that phrase a lot in serious medical treatment benefits and burdens what are, what are the pros and cons of having this treatment or not having the treatment so if you think of something like a, a tooth extraction um, that's a single treatment, either have the tooth removed or don't have the tooth removed. There'll be benefits and risks associated with that treatment. Um, if it's finely balanced, then that makes it a serious medical treatment. If it's not finely balanced and it's really bloody obvious, well then, you know, that's, that's okay. It wouldn't be SMT. The second option, uh, sorry, the second definition is where there's a choice of treatments and there's kind of, uncertainty between which treatment is the best because they're all finely balanced so you see this a lot in treatment for things like cancer where there might be um you know radiotherapy chemotherapy surgery um or medication that there's different ways to treat the the condition and then the third one i think is something that you'll come across a lot and that's where there are serious consequences as a result of what's being proposed and again, you might think, well, what's a serious consequence? What's serious for one person might not be serious for another. And you'd be right. So if you think about um, uh, like a flu jab, and this is where COVID, um, for some people, a COVID decision, sorry, a decision about a COVID vaccination is a serious medical treatment decision and for somebody else it isn't. Because for some people it might involve serious consequences. So if you're an individual who has a phobia of needles and is terrified of having any of an injection and even though everybody agrees you should have the COVID and you might even want the COVID injection but to have the COVID injection that means that the pay, you're going to have to be restrained well then that's quite a serious consequence so that's what pushes um it, what you might think of day-to-day -day decisions into this serious medical treatment kind of boundary it's the same with dentist work um you might think oh we'll have an Having a, an examination isn't serious, but if that means that the person has to be um, under general anaesthetic or restrained in some way, well, then yes, that, that is beginning to become quite invasive. 
These are some of the things that the contractor says um, serious consequences are likely to include. So anything that with serious or prolonged pain, um, side effects, so there's lots of treatments isn't there, that will have um, qu quite serious side effects or painful side effects. Um, if you think about any operation, that, that could have a potential for, for soreness and, and, and pain. Um, anything that's got major consequences, so, um, you know, an amputation, um, uh, anything that's non-reversible, so things like a hysterectomy, um, or, yeah, an, an amputation, or having a, a permanent stoma fitted, those types of things, um, that would be classed as a serious, serious uh, consequence. And if it's got a serious impact on any future choices the person would have, then that would be classed. So there's quite a broad, you know, um, the, the, the criteria that, that you'd be thinking about when you're working in SMT. And um, it's good that this is broad because the code of practice, if you think it was written in 2005, well, probably a little bit before 2005, um, and medical advances are happening all the time and things that perhaps did cause suicide effects don't now so the code of practice doesn't have a list of treatments that are smt it's about thinking about what's the impact on your person um, and what is um the, the treatment being considered so that hopefully gives you a good feel for what smt is there are some examples and um, per se there isn't a list an exhaustive list that um you know, you can look to to go, is it or, or isn't it? In my experience as an MK, if the doctor says it's an SMT decision, take it as an SMT decision. You, know, you don't need to, um, I wouldn't be checking unless it's really obvious. Okay, there are two exclusions where the MK isn't required for, in SMT decisions. And they're quite obvious, really. One, one is where it's urgent. So, you, you know, think about um, in A&E, in &E, or life-threatening circumstances, then the doctors are not going to stop administering life-saving treatment um, in order to consult an MK. It's just kind of obvious. So, so that that's okay. And the idea is that once the person um, is stable, then a decision has to be made. Then um, the, the best interest checklist will be followed. The second reason, sorry, second situation is where um, the Mental Health Act is being used to authorise the, the treatment. Um, so things like ECT is a really good example. If the person's detained under the Mental Health Act and ECT is being given under the Mental Health Act, you wouldn't have an IMCA. If the ECT has been given under the Mental Capacity Act, which is rare, very rare, but, but can happen, then an IMCA would be instructed. Um, so just there's that kind of exclusion there that if it's under the Mental Health Act, you don't have an IMCA. Right, so what's our role? And I'll just pause here for you to have a think. So imagine that you were having this big decision made about serious medical treatment and you weren't able to make that decision about should I have this operation? Should I have this dentist work? Should I have a you know colonoscopy? Should I have a peg? Should... A big decision about medical treatment. What would you want from your MK? What would you want from your advocate? And I think most of us would want somebody to really, as best they can, understand me and what my views would be on this treatment and how I felt about um, surgery or pegs or dentist work and to really try and capture that. Now, remember, it's the IMCA, you're not there to make the decision. You are there to represent the individual. But we're going to start, as we always start in any types of advocacy, with this idea of supported decision making, which has elements of self advocacy in it. Now, you might think self advocacy is an MK, it doesn't make any sense, the person lacks capacity. But I would urge you to kind of, well, yeah, just urge you to think about how you're bringing in self advocacy and the MK role. Because the person, yes, lacks capacity to make the decision, but they might not lack capacity to tell you what they want. Or, and they might not have capacity to be able to self-advocate. And sometimes, and you know this more than anyone, um, it is simply a case of making sure the person has got the right information, the right um, time, they are supporting the right environment with the people who they trust. So as an advocate, I'd be thinking about that. I mean, there's some incredible, I remember um, one advocate 
was supporting um, a young adult um, who had a learning disability and he, he was going to have a, an, a CAT scan. And they got Lego because Lego had just produced some pieces that had um, the CAT scan machine. So they were able to take that to the young man and show him. And that helped to make decisions about how he um, how he felt about it and also to kind of familiarise the person with what was going to happen. So that, that was a really good example of, of supportive decision making. Huge part of IMCA is representation. So this is where you're representing the person as the decision for them is being substituted. So as the, the doctor will make that decision. And you're going to be using non-instructors advocacy. So you need to be this investigator. You need to find out as best you can what would the person want if they could decide. And if you can't find that out, or and as, as well as finding that out, what's important to the person? Is an outdoor life really, really important? And will this surgery impact on that? Um, I remember an MK really thinking about the impact of... Um, having a peg um which is like a tube f for feeding so this person wouldn't eat food anymore they would be fed through a tube directly into the, the tummy and the advocate found out that this person absolutely loved eating they just loved the experience of food in the mouth and chewing and when they found that out the advocate then brought into the report things and considerations like how do we still give that person that experience and through talking to the care staff they introduced um like a, a tasting time so a bit like afternoon tea um it, like i'm making this time up now but say three o'clock every day the person will be given three flavors of yogurt like a spoon um so they might have like uh, lemon yogurt or hazelnut you know very strong flavors to have that experience of taste now, we might think that's not a human rights issue or life or death, serious medical treatment, but this is what we are there to help make sure that that decision really considers the impact on the individual. So that's, that, that's the type of thing that, that you could be thinking about. As you use a non instructed advocacy, you'll be thinking about what other people think. And there's two questions that you should always ask people who know the person. What do they think should happen? Which is a great question. But the better question is what do they think the person would want to happen? And then you're also thinking about what rights are important. And we will come back to that in a second. At the end of this session, we're going to spend two minutes just thinking about report writing. Um, because you will be gathering all of this information in a report. And then the last part of the IMCA role is really checking that the decision oh sorry before i do that uh, let's have a little look at the information um specific to assist medical treatment so this is a good little checklist actually of um what questions you might be looking at so you might be asking the doctor what are the alternatives and come at this as if it was um you know a good kind of test is if this was my loved one if this was my dad if this was my partner if this was my child what questions would i be asking what questions would I be wanting to know? That's a really good baseline, I think, for, for IMCA. So what are the other options? What are the risks? What do they see as the benefits and the burdens? Um, you might want to look at, um, is the treatment in line with best practice? A NICE, N-I-C-E, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, their website's a really good one because they'll have guidelines, often on um, conditions and best treatment. So if ever you're not sure, you can always refer to them. You might be thinking about the impact and what's going to happen afterwards, as well as what's the impact if the treatment isn't given. Um, what will do we know? Do we have any insights into if the person will resist the the intervention? And if so, are there any any actions and steps that can be taken to reduce that? Um, so you know, um, things I've seen advocates ask for is can can the dentist come to the house? rather than the person go to the dental surgery because they get anxious in the surgery. So if it's an investigation, a checkup, can the dentist come to the person's house? Re reasonable adjustments, fine. And, and lots of dentists will be happy to do that. Other things um, might be if it's surgery, 
you might say to the hospital, can the person go in first on the list so that they're not in hospital for four hours becoming anxious? Um, if they're first on the list, then that can, can reduce the kind of the impact and make it more likely that it'll go well. So the, these are some questions. So I'd, I'd definitely uh, keep a, 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 a list of, of these. Okay. So add. So as part of the IMCA role, uh, so it stands for second opinion approved doctor. Um, it, it's it's not a legal right um, under the Mental Capacity Act. I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but legally we don't have a right to seek a second opinion. We do if we are detained as Mental Health Act and there's the right to a second opinion approved doctor. Um, and it's a specific role. But in IMCA, um, and health decisions, and um, there isn't that legal right. I think they um, they are debating at the moment to introduce a law that gives particularly intensive care um, the right to a second opinion. Um, but we don't actually have it at the minute. But what we do have is a culture where um, doctors are very used to having second opinions, um, even third opinions. I know I've had um, third opinions when... I've gone for family members and it's been really finely balanced whether to do something or not. The doctors like, in my experience, to get a second opinion um, because, as you know, medical decisions aren't straightforward. They they can be quite, it's an art, isn't it? We just don't know sometimes what the best thing to do is. So if you're not sure, and again, think about if this was my loved one, would we want a second opinion? Sometimes it's really straightforward and sometimes it isn't. If you're feeling that there's this balance here or if you're concerned that actually it's not being, the decision's not being taken in the person's best interests. Um, and then the last one, which we're going to talk in a minute, um, sometimes you might find um, there's, there's like an unconscious or it can be quite conscious sometimes bias against um, people with a learning disability or older people with dementia uh, and disabled people um, in general about not um, offering certain treatment. So if you're worried about decisions not to treat on the basis of somebody's disability, um, then that's where I think a second opinion would be very sensible. I'll put a slide up on DNAR, I apologise the correct terminology is DNA CPR, so do not attempt to come and commonly, commonly put, oh, restart your, your heart and um, CPR. Um, and lots of people have a DNA CPR order on, on their records because attempting CPR for lots of people um, is not the best thing. And we just want to start this slide by acknowledging, you know, that for lots of people, particularly end of life, you know, if, if your heart is is has stopped and CPR is not likely to, to work, well, you probably don't want your last moments to have somebody, you know, violently trying to restart your heart. That that, that can be quite distressing and, and traumatic and it's it's not not everybody. It's not going to be suitable for everybody in every circumstance. So I wanted to start by saying that DNA CP, I, um, CPR is not like on the TV where somebody collapses and then there's a few chest pumps and oh, the person going back to life. That's not what it's like in reality. Um, so the the decision to have to administer CPR is it's a medical decision, and the clinical team, the doctors, if they feel, if they believe, medically believe, that the resuscitation attempt will fail, then they can um, quite legitimately put a do not attempt CPR order. Now, there is a, a school of thought that says that it's just a recommendation, that's not actually a decision, and that the, the, the you wouldn't need an MCA for these because it's not actually a decision, it's, um, it's just a recommendation. Our view is that... Um, a recommendation is a decision. Um, so if you're getting the referrals, I would definitely still still be involved. Um, there are also questions about who is making that decision and under Mental Capacity Act, um, it's pretty clear that an IMC gets involved with the NHS and making the decision. Sometimes the team might not be the NHS, it might be care providers like the nurse and staff from the care provider. So it is a bit complicated. 
I, I think just to reassure you, if, if you are getting referrals for DNA CPR, I would still be taking them as the care. You know, as a general point, we want more people to get advocacy, not less. So I, I, I don't think this is a big thing. Um, but but yeah, it, the what you need to check when you get a, a referral for DNA CPR is would the person, is it likely that they would want the DNA CPR? Um, and this is where you want to be talking to the clinical team about this benefits and burdens. Is it likely to work if it's not likely to work? Um, lots of medical professionals will tell you that the consequences of having a, you know, um, a CPR and broken ribs, you can have brain damage. Um, and if the person's at end of life, then you can see how the benefit and burden, you know, for another week of life, but with broken ribs and brain damage, actually that that the benefit of that doesn't outweigh the extra few days of life. So it's a very finely balanced and you want to talk to the team, the clinical team. You also want to check, and this is where you really need to be um, interested and curious about what's driving the DNA CPR. If it's about it being medically futile, that's okay. But we've seen DNA CPR being given to people on the basis of disability. And the, you might find this shocking um, or you might not, but you know we've seen, particularly in COVID, um, quite extreme examples that there was um, a, a deaf person who had DNA CPR because they were deaf and on the DNA CPR said they couldn't communicate. Just absolute discrimination. Um, we've seen blanket DNA CPRs put on all people in a particular care home. We saw people being put under pressure to accept a DNA CPR because they were in a care home. We've seen people with a learning disability be given a DNA CPR with the medical reason they have a learning disability. That is not okay. That is really not okay. That's discrimination. That's um, not looking at the individual and saying, is it like you did a CPR attempt would work? So that's what you'd be looking at as, as the MK and um, doing that check. Um, is the person being treated equally and having the same access to healthcare as everybody else? So that's DNA CPR. Um, I've put um, a link here to uh, some case law where it basically said that the the person doesn't have to be consent. The person doesn't have to give consent to um, DNA CPR, and the person doesn't actually have to be. Um, told that there's a DNA CPR if, and this is really important, if um, it's going to cause a lot of distress. If you've got somebody, you know, because of their um, impairment, that would be very, very distressing. It might be justifiable not to tell them. However, the presumption is that the person will be involved and also their representatives and particularly their their family and their their relatives would be consulted and included and again it's i want you to feel the difference between consulting me and then doing what i say so the presumption is they would consult me do i want a dna cpr order on my file but that doesn't mean that they're going they have to do what i say if they feel that the they be in the medical team, they feel it's medically futile. It, it is a medical decision. It's a bit like going to the doctor. You can't demand a particular treatment, can you? But you can ask, you can influence. And it's the same here. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in that case law, um, there's the link. And I'm going to finish with um, something called diagnostic overshadowing, which is this really insidious, um, I don't want to describe it really, it thing that, that happens particularly um, in adults and children who have a learning disability. And it's where symptoms of physical health or ill health are dismissed or overlooked because of the, the person's disability. So a good example of this might be somebody who is hitting their face or banging their head or, or rubbing parts of their body in like a, a self-soothing way. Um, and actually, that's a sign of pain. That's a sign of toothache. I'm hitting my, my, my teeth, my face, my gums because I'm in pain. But that's dismissed because the, the professionals around me assume that that's because of my lens disability. It's really 
serious. It's really serious. In the last 10 years, we have seen so many preventable deaths um, and some are really, really shocking. Um, there was a, a, a gentleman, a young man, um, Richard Handley, who died of constipation. Constipation. People don't die of constipation, but his his pain was overlooked. It was ignored. It was attributed to his learning disability, and, and he died. He, he died. And there's lots of too many, far too many um, examples of people not accessing healthcare. Um, it's got serious consequences because it's resulting in poorer health health outcomes and, you know, very dramatically reduced life, life expectancy. So if you're an adult with a learning disability, you die earlier. And that's not okay. You know, learning disabilities is not, doesn't cause, isn't a, an ill health condition. It's, um, it's just not okay. So as an advocate, I just wanted to flag this. Um, and there's a great um, article here um, that, that I'd encourage you to, to read. Because as an advocate, particularly working with people with a learning disability, but I think you can see this at end of life with older people as well, uh, and people with dementia, um, it, it's worth checking are the decisions being made and influenced because of the person's disability rather than the condition. So just, just wanted to flag that up. Um, okay, and then this is the last slide. So write in your report. So when you've gathered that information, so I'll go back to that slide where the questions are. So when you've gathered this information, you want to pour it in to a report, into a written report. It doesn't have to be 10 pages long, by the way. If it's really complicated or complex, then you might want it to be 10 pages long, but it, it doesn't need to be. And what you want to do in your report is you want to say, this is the decision being made and why. So, you know, um, there we go. So the, the, the and I've been asked to, support and represent you know mrs perkins because a decision needs to be made about um a, a dentist in you know dental work and um, she's been complaining of pain the staff have tried to look to her mouth and she won't let them um she's now stopping eating um so a decision needs to be made about whether she should go, uh, have um go you know, have some dental work or an investigation so that's the beginning set the scene as succinctly as you can, what's, what's the decision and why. And then you want to go straight into um, what have you found out that's relevant to the decision. And you want to say, if you've managed to find out the person's wishes or likely wishes, then you can say the impact of the decision. So the impact of the treatment, the impact of not having the treatment. And then if there's any views from other people, definitely put them in. And I think in SMT decisions, it's really helpful to summarise information and the benefits and burdens. Sometimes that's a column, it's like a table, here are the benefits, here are the burdens. Sometimes it's like two paragraphs, but that can be really helpful in um, capturing how it's going to, it's likely to impact on this person. And that's, that's how I do the report. So you're not making the decision, do not make recommendations, you're not a, a medical professional. You think of it like if this was your loved one, what information would you want the, the decision maker to know about them and um, really come at it from the person's perspective. What is it that you need the decision maker to understand about your partner as best you can in the time constraints that you've got? If you can't find any information out, and this will happen from time to time, that I've worked with advocates who have gone to visit somebody and because of the circumstances, they're asleep and they're not likely to wake up you know, or when they do wake up, it's very, very confused and you can't find out information. That's okay. You just say that in your post of not being able to find out. And then you you might just come at it from a, this is what the guidance says. This is what people think the, the likely impact is going to be. That's okay. Um, be truthful. Do as much as you can to try and find that out. But it's okay if, if you can't because these decisions will, be ha will happen quite quickly. All right then. So I... We'll leave you to, if you've got any questions, please just jot them in the chat box because I'll be able to access them later or you can email me and I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, otherwise, good luck with the SMT decision role. Take care, everyone.